lifestyle topics. It sounds like the lamest kind of topic that you could possibly talk about because who wants to talk about a lifestyle? They want tactics, they want pragmatic things. Well, newsflash, the lifestyle is the most important piece because that is the part that is impacting you on the daily. So we're gonna break down the lifestyle habits and traits that contribute to abdominal weight gain. This way you can correct them and I will give you some pragmatic tips. So let's go ahead and jump in without further ado. The first one sounds kind of weird, but it's overdoing carbohydrates without giving them a place to go. Okay, because I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to go do uh, a low carb protocol or anything like that. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you're going to have carbohydrates, you need to make it a habit to consume them and do something with them. Because just like anything, carbohydrates will store as fat if they're not used. But when we're talking about central adiposity and fat around the midsection and visceral fat, it seems to be even more pronounced with that carbohydrate relationship. There's a study that's published in the journal Nutrition Reviews that took a look at 69 overweight people, okay? And it divided them into two groups. One was a lower carb group with slightly higher fat, and one was a higher carb group with slightly lower fat. However, what's interesting is even the low carb group was still getting 43% of their calories from carbs. Okay, so in no way was this like a keto study or anything like that. It was just one group was slightly lower carb, one group was slightly higher carb. Okay, and they had them go on a diet for eight weeks at maintenance calories and then eight weeks in a deficit. Okay, well, there's a lot of things that they were testing, but in the world of visceral fat, it was very interesting what happened. The lower carb group over the course of the entire 16 weeks lost 11% of their visceral fat compared to the slightly higher carbohydrate group only losing 1%. So it was only a 12% difference in carbohydrates and it made that much of a change in their visceral fat. Okay, now the lower carb group lost 4.4% of their total body fat. So as a ratio, they lost significantly more in the visceral fat region than they did overall. That's a nice ratio. Like I would love to be losing more in the midsection in the visceral fat region, right? Because the visceral fat has a lot of negative attributes that we really want to avoid. What ends up happening is it seems to be, okay, remember with science, it's, we're never certain, right? We're never 100% certain, but it looks as though insulin resistance plays a role here. And sometimes all it takes is bumping the carbohydrates down a little bit to improve that. But better yet, I don't wanna suggest that everyone just goes low carb, that's not practical for everybody, I get it, but use the carbs otherwise. So if you're not gonna use them, maybe drop them down. But if you're using them, great. Just eat them and burn them so that they're not going to contribute to potential insulin resistance. Let's talk men specifically for just a second and then I've got something specifically for women within this same vein because this whole insulin resistance piece plays a very important role with testosterone and male hormones too. So with testosterone, before I get into this study, all kinds of things can affect testosterone, okay? Of course, just general aging, of course, uh, exposure to different environmental factors. Um, poor sleep is a huge one. Stress is a huge one. Insulin resistance is a big one. We'll talk about that in just a second because there's a study published in the journal Medical Hypothesis that found that when testosterone levels were declining, there is an increase in estrogen receptor beta activity. Okay, estrogen receptor beta is essentially the receptor for estrogen. When you have more activity at the receptor level, it means more estrogen is being received. When more estrogen is being received and utilized and more activation of that beta receptor, what happens is you have an impairment of GLUT4. Okay, GLUT4 is a glucose transporter. It is supposed to take the glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cell dependent on insulin. So what that means is if GLUT4 is becoming impaired, it means even when we're signaling glucose, when glucose is there and we're signaling insulin, excuse me, that GLUT4 isn't bringing the glucose in. So glucose is staying elevated, leading to, you guessed it, insulin resistance. So testosterone, more estrogen, or low testosterone, more estrogen, impaired glucose tolerance, increased fat gain, which leads to, guess what? More estrogen and less testosterone. And then the cycle repeats itself. 
So you can see how there's this tie-in with insulin resistance with testosterone, and then we connect the dots with insulin resistance and that whole issue with visceral fat. So it becomes very important. Okay, so I wanted to make a note that today's video is sponsored by Hone. If you are a guy and you're focused on like just male health and just optimization in general, check them out. They are super cool. There's a link down below. So if you've been wanting to maybe go to a doctor and talk about uh, your hormones, talk about testosterone, talk about those things, I really recommend you check them out because they have set it up in such a way where you can have a telehealth consult with a physician. You can do the right thing, do it in the right order, and then they'll send you an assessment Okay, so you can go ahead and you can basically get all your assessment done for different hormone panels, things like that. Send it in, you sit down, you can have a face-to-face -face Skype call with a physician. They'll talk to you and do everything there. And if you need some treatment, they'll handle it there. So if you're over the age of 30, over the, or heck, even if you're younger, but if you're mainly over the age of 30, 35, and you're a male and you're really trying to just get a grasp on your male health, I definitely recommend you at least get an assessment so you can look at the different panels, look at where you're at, and be able to consult with a physician. They really do put that at the forefront. Really, that whole like communication with the patient and the doctor is very important with them. And you get follow-ups every 90 days to see how you're doing. That way, if you need to do additional treatments or do something different, you can. So that link is down below, and you can save 25% using honehealth.com slash Delauer. Again, so you can get 25% off using honehealth.com slash Delauer. So use that link down below in the description and thank you for the awesome sponsorship. So then when we jump over, there's another piece that I wanna talk on like this whole insulin resistance piece because this one was published in the journal Nutrition Metabolism. And this showed some interesting stuff with women. Now this particular study looked at a high carb, lower fat diet versus a very low carb, closer to ketogenic diet. Ultimately, at the end of this study, they found the keto group ended up actually eating more calories, surprisingly, which is kind of interesting. Because they ended up eating like 1,800 calories on average versus 1,500 calories in the other groups. So they ate more, but there was a threefold reduction in visceral fat in the low carb group compared to the uh, higher carb group in women. Right? It was still good in men, but not as good as it was in women, showing that this whole like, insulin thing probably plays a role with women just as much as with men. It's just using different avenues, perhaps. So speaking of all of that and how that intertwines for men and women, let's talk stress and sleep for just a second. I'll touch on sleep because it kind of ropes in with stress. If you're not sleeping, it's probably making you stressed and vice versa, right? There are multiple studies that demonstrate that sleep is ultimately a risk factor for insulin resistance and diabetes, okay? I can think of one off the top of my head that looked at nurses over the course of uh, 10 years. They got on average five hours of sleep a night and they found that there was a 15 to 30% increase in their diabetes and prediabetes risk, even when adjusted for BMI. What that means is that that cumulative buildup of stress and poor sleep led to insulin resistance. And if that becomes an issue, then you know what's gonna happen, right? Weight gain, especially around the midsection. Well, there was a study published in the journal Obesity that looked at 2,500 people, and it did hair cortisol tests, which tests the cortisol over the course of a longer period of time, not salivary, which is like the acute, like instant reading. They found that higher levels of cortisol were positively correlated with more weight and increased waist circumference, which doesn't necessarily imply visceral fat directly, but it probably does because that's what would more than likely push that midsection out. But even still, central adiposity or belly fat in general, probably not too good. But then there was a study published in the International Journal of Obesity. This one looked at six-year-olds, okay, over 3,000 of them, and it measured their cortisol. And once again, it found that same correlation. It found that there was an increase in abdominal obesity directly correlated with an increase in cortisol, even in young individuals, which says that the insulin resistance piece is probably a bigger factor, okay? Because they're stressed, maybe they're eating more, they're becoming more insulin resistant, cortisol levels are up, cortisol and insulin really can have this interplay together. So it's very important. There's even some studies that demonstrate like if you go through stress management protocols, like this one study was really cool, divided these people into two groups, said, okay, you're both type two diabetics, one group is gonna go under a stress management protocol, one is not, one group is not. The stress management protocol did reduce perceived stress, and alongside that, it reduced their HbA1c, okay, their long tail sort of glucose reading. And so there's definitely 
definitely an impact there, and it doesn't take much, okay? But you have to be able to put the best foot forward in terms of modulating your stress in your life. That is a big thing, and it's not witch doctor woo-woo weird stuff. It does actually work if you take a little bit of time to breathe or to meditate, and if it does actually make an impact on your HbA1c, it will probably make an impact on your visceral fat. The next one is you're not eating soluble fiber, all right? I know it's a little more tactical and not necessarily lifestyle, but how hard is it to add some chia or some flax meal or something to whatever you're eating? It's not that hard, right? Well, get this, for every 10 gram increase in soluble fiber, there's a decrease in the accumulation of visceral fat by approximately 3.7%. At least that's what this study published in the journal Obesity thought out, right? So with that, wow, how hard is it to increase my fiber intake by 10 grams with flax seeds or chia seeds or beta glucans from mushrooms. It's not that hard. So the study that was published in the journal Obesity was over the course of five years, looked at over 1,100 people and it had them take a look at their diet, right? They looked backwards at their diet and they found that there was, again, this relationship. If there was a lot of soluble fiber in physical activity, there was a lower level of visceral fat. Okay, now the physical activity plays a role too, but those were the two things in tandem that seemed to really be aligned with lower levels of visceral fat. So then we look at some more of the data, we realize, okay, this is probably a pretty important thing. It has to do with short chain fatty acids. Okay, the fibers in our gut ferment, they break down, and that feeds different bacteria, and that produces short chain fatty acids, which can act as signaling devices, and guess what? help us modulate glucose. It's all coming back to this kind of common theme here with glucose and insulin resistance. Fiber helps that system out. Therefore, maybe we're putting ourselves in a better spot. The last one, and one of the most important ones if you ask me, is not only drinking the resistance training Kool-Aid. Okay, what I mean by that? Obviously, I like to lift weights, okay? It's no, no mystery, right? But there's a lot of people out there that will say, lift weights, lift weights, lift weights, and they sort of undercut the cardio. Well, when it comes down to visceral fat, it looks like cardio, higher intensity cardio, might be the way to go. Resistance training is still amazing and you should do it. Okay, retaining muscle mass, preventing sarcopenia, for insulin resistance and all that, it's great. But for direct impact on the visceral fat, check this out. There was a meta-analysis of over 35 different studies, all of which were at least four weeks long. And they found that aerobic, training at a higher intensity triggered a decrease in visceral fat, whereas resistance training did not in that particular situation. But check this out, because there's another study, and now it starts to make sense. This one was in journal Obesity, and it took a look at 16 investigations, okay? And it found that when obese people with metabolic dysfunction did cardio, it did not impact their visceral fat. But when obese people without metabolic dysfunction did cardio, they did lose visceral fat. Okay, so what that implies is that when the mitochondria and everything is functioning in a normal way, it does burn visceral fat. But here's the caveat. In these 16 investigations, they were looking at low intensity, like maybe a brisk walk. Okay, that's great for health, it is. But as far as burning visceral fat, it may not be what you need. Okay, it looks like you need a higher intensity aerobic training every now and then to directly work on the visceral fat. And it probably, again probably, has something to do with the fact that you have a larger and longer growth hormone spike with high intensity cardio. Resistance training spikes growth hormone too, but high intensity cardio seems to elevate it for about 24 hours, okay? This plays a very big role because it can stimulate hormone sensitive lipase, which allows the release of fatty acids out of a fat cell, lipolysis. So very, very important to add in the higher intensity cardio, not even hit, just higher intensity aerobic steady state so that you can liberate more of these fats specifically from the visceral adipose tissue. Okay, so stress, sleep, if you're gonna have carbs, utilize them, add the fiber in, don't just do resistance training and don't just do low intensity cardio. Get on a bike and move, do something, get the heart rate up because it's so unbelievably important. Okay, so as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to check out Hone Health and get that 25% off discount and I'll see you tomorrow.